Hi guys and welcome to Becoming a Better You. This video is the full course on dyslexia, on ADD. This is for professionals, this is for parents of children with dyslexia with ADD, or perhaps you can use it for yourself if you do have dyslexia or ADD. I have previously released this course in individual videos. However, I've seen from people viewing the videos, they sort of pick and choose episodes. That isn't the way to go about this course because every video builds upon the next one. So if you do dyslexia, if you do ADD or ADHD and you want to get ahead or you have kids or you're a professional, a teacher, a psychologist that works with kids and adults that suffer with these things, Watch this, study this, learn this. As I said, I have been coaching kids, I've been coaching adults with one of the main things with ADD, with dyslexia, with ADHD. That's not the only thing I do, but that is one of the main things I do. And I have been doing this for over a decade. I do know what I'm talking about. I have helped people go very successfully. I've had started with kids many, many years ago that, for example, when I met them, they couldn't read. They've, you know, applied to do medicine in a university. So it just goes to show doing dyslexia, doing ADD, it doesn't have to be a hindrance if you know how to go about it. So without further ado, let's get on. And here is the complete course. Hi, welcome to my course called Dyslexia Done Right. I am a person who has dedicated well over a decade of my life to finding solutions that work for dyslexics, ADHDers, ADDers. I have worked with many clients on one-to-one -one basis, helping children succeed. I've taken children who haven't been able to read to pass public exams with flying colors. What you're going to learn in this course is how you can effectively and successfully help your children who do dyslexia, ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia. This is a course for you to know how they work and how to help them. In this course, we're gonna look at how your child works best. We're gonna look at their concentration levels. We're gonna look at stress levels. We're gonna look at the best learning styles, the best techniques for them to succeed. We're going to cover reading, writing, math skills and advanced skills to help them succeed at school. This course is for you if you are a parent of a dyslexic, an ADHD, an ADD, a child with dyspraxia, with dyscalculia. This is the course for you and this will help your children succeed in school with what you learn here. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope to see you later in the course. If you're not, 100% convinced yet, that's absolutely fine. There is a preview of the course, so you can have a look to see what you're getting first. I hope to see you in the course. Welcome, thank you for purchasing the course. I hope you find all the information that we're going to discuss here highly useful and very interesting. In this course, we're going to see many things. First of all, we're going to look at what dyslexia and ADHD and all those things are. Not the technical definitions, but what they really mean to us as parents. And we're going to see how we can help our children, how you can help your children to be the best they can be. We're going to see what you as parents can do to help your children, both generally, in general organization, in daily things, as well as at school, helping them with those difficult subjects. And we'll look at lots of skills and things we can use to help them. We're going to look at things like concentration, stress levels, why lazy is just the wrong word for our children. We're going to look at procrastination. We're going to look at different learning styles. We're even going to look at techniques 
to help us master our minds to overcome any challenges we face. We're going to look at reading skills, writing skills, math skills. We're going to look at advanced skills for studying for exams. We're going to cover all this in this course. So please go to the new video and I really hope you enjoy this course, find it very useful and learn lots. And of course, help your children to succeed with this information. There are two ways of winning in an examination, one credible, the other reverse. You have unfortunately chosen the latter method and appear to be much pleased with your success. The first, extremely discreditable feature of your performance was missing the infantry. For in that failure, you demonstrated beyond refutation your slovenly, happy-go-lucky harem scurum work, which you have always been distinguished in at different schools. With all the advantages you had, with all the abilities you foolishly think yourself to possess, and with some of your relations claim for you, with all the efforts that have been made to make your life easy and agreeable, and you are neither oppressive or distasteful, this is the grand result you've come up among the second-rate and third-rate classes who are only good for commissions in a cavalry regiment. I am certain that if you cannot prevent yourself from leading the idle, useless, profitable life you have had during your school days in the later months, you will become a mere social wastrel of the public school failures, and you will degenerate into a shabby and unhappy futile existence. When that happens, you will have to bear all the blame for such misfortunes yourself. A letter from his father. Your work is an insult to your intelligence. If you would only trace out a plan of action for yourself and carry it out and be determined to do so, I'm sure you could accomplish anything you wish. But it is that thoughtlessness of yours which is your greatest enemy. In a letter from a mother to her son. So who are they talking about? Winston Churchill. What most people see first. Short attention span, which can become hyper-focused for long periods of time, like when they're playing computer games. Poor planning, disorganized, impulsive, make snap decisions. Distorted sense of time, lack of awareness, how long something will take. This is very common. Impatience. Inability to convert words and concepts, vice versa. A learning disability may or may not be present. Difficulty following directions. Daydreaming. Acting without consideration. Lacking in social graces. But why do people see this? It's because we compare it to people whose attention is not easily distracted from the task at hand, whose ability to sustain effort is dependable and steady. Purposefully organised, they have long-term strategies that they can adhere to. With awareness of timing, cost of completed in time, on space, and good staying power. They have patience, and they're aware of good things take time, they have willingness to wait, they play on a team, or they're team players, could we say. They focus on following through, tending to details and taking care of everything they have to do. They look before they leap. They're nurturing, creating and supporting communities and values. And they really want things to last. Now let's look at our children in a different light. 
They have the ability to monitor the environment constantly. They have the ability to enter a chase on a moment's notice. They're flexible. They have a readiness to change strategy quickly. Powerlessness. The ability to sustain drive, but only when we're hot on the trail of some goal. We're visual or concrete thinkers. We clearly see tangible goals, even if there are no words for it. We're interdependent. We become bored by mundane tasks. Well, that's not a bad thing. Enjoying new ideas, excitement, the hunt of being hot on the trail of something. Willingness and ability to take risks and face danger. No time for niceties when decisions have to be made. Now this is a very different way to look at things. So what does this all mean? Well, thanks to the work of Tom Hartman and his great metaphor, farmers and hunters. Farmers making up the normal, 80 to 90% of the population, and hunters making up the dyslexics, the ADDers, the ADHDers. And of course, that means we live in a predominantly farmer society. And the education systems are developed for the farmer society, not the hunters. To talk about stress, we must talk about the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system has the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system deals with states when we are fearful, when we're angry, when we're anxious, when we're stressed. Many of us know the sympathetic nervous system by the fight or flight mode. It's when we're in high alert, ready for action. When we're in this state, we are using what we already know to help us. If we were about to unfortunately fight someone, if we know how to box, then we can use the knowledge of boxing. However, if we don't know how to box, we're not going to suddenly learn how to box right before the fight. We're not going to think, stop, okay, I'm going to throw a left punch here, a right hook here. It just doesn't work. So this is very, very useful, this nervous system, to be able to take knowledge we already have and control and have mastered and use it in these situations when we need it rapidly. The parasympathetic nervous system is what we need for when we're sleeping, when we're resting, when we're digesting our food, when we're growing. It's when we are relaxed and we can have our attention focused. It's when we can concentrate. This is, in effect, the learning mode. It's where we can record information and play it back. So why is this so important when it comes to dealing with stress, especially with our children? Well, the parasympathetic nervous system is where we learn. And the sympathetic nervous system, we don't learn. However, hunters tend to live in the sympathetic nervous system because we are always waiting to change modes, looking for the action. When things are out of balance and for a long time, this is where the lazy hunter appears. The amount of children that I have seen that have been called lazy. They're not lazy. They are just at a point where they can no longer function due to the constant stress they are under. They are constantly functioning in the sympathetic nervous system. And when we're in the sympathetic nervous system, we can no longer function. Stress, fear, anxiety leads to cortisol production. Cortisol production 
is useless when it comes to learning and relaxing. In fact, it counters this. The fight or flight mode produces adrenaline. Again, we cannot run long term with adrenaline and cortisol in our systems. They are the stressors, they are the stress hormones. We need to get out of this. The only way to get out of this is to be relaxed, to have the right sleep, to be eating the right diet, among other things. Hunters need to work constantly to learn how to be able to switch to the parasympathetic nervous system and stay there. And this all starts with the breath. In the next video, we will start to look at what we need to do to be able to start changing from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system. If this isn't done, or if one of the things we talk about are off, we will switch back to the sympathetic nervous system where learning can no longer take place. So something we haven't talked about yet are the early warning signs of a hunter. What are these early warning signs? Well, although even if we see them, they may not mean anything definite, there are things we can look out for. First of all, in the early years, we can have advanced speech and logic processing. However, sometimes speech can sometimes also be delayed. These children tend to step back and observe groups first. They don't tend to launch in at the park to play with the group. They will always observe first. They might have a slight clumsiness or be uncoordinated. There's the family history to consider because these things, 99.9% .9 of the time, are genetic. And the other obvious thing to look for is high intelligence. When we know we're dealing with a hunter, this is the first step for parents that they need to learn to recognize. This is very, very important because when we see these things happening, it's our job to step in and stop these things happening immediately. It might take some practice and that's absolutely fine. Occasionally we're going to get it wrong. That's not a problem. So what do we have to look for and stop? When there is an unrecognized stimulus, this is the first time we can possibly get problems. The second is if there is some confusion coming in. Now confusion we'll see later. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to recognize it. Disorientation. When the child seems to be becoming disorientated, this is a clear sign something's going to go wrong. If they assimilate something incorrectly, then we need to go through it again and help them assimilate it correctly. If they have negative emotions towards something, we must stop these and retrain them to become positive emotions. When there's frustration, again, frustration, we'll see later, does not necessarily have to be a bad thing but we must learn that it's a good thing, just like confusion. These things can only happen when we have a certain level of knowledge acquired. Incorrect solutions to try to process information. This ranges from behavioral problems to maths problems. Any information that they are trying to process, this comes back to confusion, disorientation, frustration, leads to negative emotions. Compulsive use of incorrect solutions. This is a clear sign we're using the sympathetic nervous system. The disability to function correctly. This is very, very typical. We as parents know our children and we have these built-in responses that we use for certain types of things subconsciously. However, in these cases, we need to recognize specifically these things. At this stage, all I'm asking is for you to learn to recognize them. In the next video, we will look at how to start dealing with them. But right now, we must find these points. So just look and learn 
these responses from your children. When you identify these points individually, see how they're building in your child. Look for the tells that these things are starting to happen. If we can identify these tells, then this is the key thing we need to help them in stopping these processes from happening. Take your time, have patience. Sometimes tells are very, very obvious, and sometimes they're very subtle. Look for body language, look for expressions, look for the building of energy. Many, many things can happen to express these tells. So once we've identified these things, these processes that go on, we need to talk about something called rapport. Now everybody knows more or less what rapport is, but let's cover the basics. Rapport needs to be practiced constantly with your children. If we are developing this constantly with them in situations where we need instant rapport with them, we will be able to build it very quickly. So, how do we develop this rapport? First of all, mirroring and matching. This is the most important part of rapport. How do we mirror and how do we match someone? Well, mirror and matching consists of copying the other person. If I'm hunched over like this, then we hunch over. If I've got my shoulders back and I'm standing upright, mirror this. When I say something, if I make an expression, when it's your turn to talk, make a similar expression. Possibly with the other hand, it doesn't have to be exact. We can mirror and match language as well, expressions people use. This might sound as though when we do it, they're going to realize what we're doing. But in fact, it's amazing how much we can do without people realizing we're doing it. Practice. Matching and mirroring, especially first thing in the morning, when we pick up our kids from school. We can practice this with anybody. Building rapport is a great technique at work, with our friends. But we are looking at it mainly, obviously, to help our children. Once we are mirroring and matching them effectively, then try and lead them on to do something. So for example, if they're hunched over like this, you hunch over. Then when you think you've got their rapport, try standing upright or sitting upright. If they copy, you know you've got their rapport. You could try touching your ear as you speak. If in a couple of minutes later, they do the same thing or go somewhere close, again, we know we have their rapport. Now we can lead them. When we have their rapport, we can lead them into another state. We can get them more excited, we can calm them down, we can give them positive suggestions. When we're about to start our homework, then building rapport before we start will highly decrease procrastination and we can get things started so much more easily. If we do this throughout, for example, doing homework, and we see the child gets distracted or disorientated or getting frustrated, reconnect with rapport as fast as possible, maybe through changing the subject as well. And once we have that, we can then go back to what we were doing. Now, at times, building rapport is just simply not going to be suffice. When our children have got to maximum level frustration and they cannot help themselves, one of the best techniques we can use is to do something unexpected. Why do we do this? Because it gives us an opportunity. That signal goes straight to the subconscious mind, passing the conscious mind. And in the seconds afterwards, we can then enter with something new and change their minds, a calm state, a fun activity. When we do this, 
and it is a surprise and it is unexpected. So we cannot do the same thing all the time. It has to be different. When we do that, it can be a very, very helpful tool to break the negative cycles that we're in. Whilst we're doing this, we must also look at another process. We as parents know our children, we know how far they can go, or sometimes how they're limited. And we try to push, or we try to pull them, more than we should for them. So we must respect where they are and follow the rule, 90% easy, 10% challenge for them. If you start stressing, game over. As soon as you feel any frustration or stress yourself, you have to first calm down, take control of yourself before you can start helping your children. Because if you get stressed or if you're frustrated, then you cannot help your child help themselves. I've seen many parents and I've done it myself. I get to a point possibly before I get stressed. And I say, now come on, let's go. You can do better. Snap out of it. All these expressions are really not helpful. We must control ourselves and our language. We'll go into this in more detail in another video. Yet for now, just remember to practice these things. So now we are trying to identify from the previous video all the points of process for negative behavior and we're learning to build rapport with our children. Just these steps alone should help you and your children greatly. When dealing with hunters, it is vitally important to remember we are an ecosystem. What do I mean by this? I mean, previously we've talked about the autonomic nervous system to be able to control highly more effectively the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. We have to have certain things under control. When we have things under control, we can far better increase the chances of being in the parasympathetic nervous system over the sympathetic nervous system. So what is it we have to control? We have to control sleep, diet, exercise, relaxation. How do we control these things? Well, let's go through them step by step. First, diet. What is the best diet for a hunter? I have seen so many and quite complex diets to feed a hunter. However, there are two simple styles of eating that we can use as hunters. I've tried them out on many, many people, and especially myself, and I can personally tell you the benefits of these two types of diets. I say two types, they're both very, very similar in nature. One is the paleo diet, the other is the keto diet. So what are these types of diets? The paleo diet, lots of protein, lots of vegetables, low sugar vegetables, Nuts, seeds, some fruit, little starch, and no sugar. Now I know we're told to eat lots of fruit and vegetables, and this is right. What we're going to do, however, is change this from lots of fruit and vegetables to lots of vegetables and some fruit. If we're working on a five pieces a day, this is normally recommended in Western countries. I would tend to go for four pieces of vegetable and one piece of fruit. Why is this? 
because fruit is high sugar. So if we have fruits that are lower sugar, that's great. And if we have vegetables that are higher sugar, the sweet ones, carrots, etc., then try and avoid these ones. The other type of diet is the keto diet, or where we are trying to get the body into a state of ketosis. What is ketosis? This is when our body produces the sugar it needs from fats rather than giving directly the sugars into the body. So what is the difference between the paleo diet and the keto diet? Basically, we are putting in slightly higher levels of fats to reduce the amount of carbs within the diet. So in the keto diet, we are looking to be somewhere between only 20 to 50 grams of carbohydrates and sugars a day. Now I know for some people this may seem very, very low, but after a couple of days, our body gets used to it and it starts producing all the sugar the brain needs. This also has many secondary beneficial effects. Keto is used for diabetics. Keto is used to treat cancer patients. We're not going to go into this because it's not in the scope of our videos. If you want to learn more information, there is a mountain of it in Google. If we are using the keto diet, it's very important to remember healthy fats. This is also true of the paleo diet. What do I mean by healthy fats? Raw, organic, nut and seed oils, coconut, olive oil, sesame oil, sunflower oil. These must be unrefined and raw. If we're going to cook with them, coconut oil, as it is a saturated fat over a polyunsaturated fat, and therefore the breakdown of the healthy fats through heating occur far more slowly. Ideally, to cook, we use no fat at all. Don't fry, use the oven, buy an air fryer. Of course, the other healthy fat is fish. Now with fish, we all know we have to be very careful of the heavy metal levels. And now the new thing, the plastics. Again, this is a huge topic and is not really in the scope of this course. There is a mountain of information online about heavy metals and plastics in fish. So please do your research if you eat a lot of fish. When we're talking about fish, obviously we're talking about oily fishes. Sardines, salmon, trout, etc. So why is it so important to control the diet? And why are we looking at diets with very little or no sugar in them? We need to control the blood sugar levels. If we're eating lots of sugar, when we eat the sugar, we have a spike. And then we have a crash. And then we have a spike, eating more sugar and another crash, and another spike and another crash. When we're having these spikes and crashes of sugar, it also stresses our bodies. For hunters, this is very, very negative we have to keep the blood sugar as stable as possible to avoid this extra increase of stress. Once we regulate blood sugar levels, we can highly increase concentration rates, lower frustration levels. So if we're saying protein, it can be meat, it might not be meat, but if we're saying protein, vegetables, some fruit, nuts, seeds, no sugar. My biggest question I'm always asked is, but what do we have for breakfast? Protein breaks down more slowly and so does fat than carbohydrates. As they break down at a slower level, they give us the calories or the nutrition we need over longer periods of time. What does this mean? It means throughout the school day, our concentration can last longer. Therefore, instead of the typical bowl of sugar cereal, we can go for 
nuts and seeds, we can make our own types of mueslis. We can have the very traditional egg and bacon, the English breakfast. Yes, but I don't have time to cook that in the mornings. Fair enough. We can pre-prepare breakfasts that they like. But my child doesn't like vegetables. How can I solve this? It's a question of trial and error. It does not have to be complicated food. Another very important point is talking about processed foods. What do I mean by processed foods? Generally, if a packet has an ingredients list, it's been processed. We know that white flour, white sugar that are already off the table have been highly processed. So we want unprocessed foods. And if we are going to process foods, I love bacon. Bacon is a processed food. However, I buy pork from the butchers and I cure it myself so I know exactly the process going into it and using no chemicals. Curing bacon is a very simple process. But what about birthdays? You can make cakes. You can make biscuits. At home, when I make them, I tend to put the quarter amount of sugar into cakes. So on these special occasions, as we said, for paleo, it's not a problem. We have low starch, so we can eat some flour. If you're following the keto, then this would be more difficult. There are alternatives to flours to still make cakes using nut flours. So we can still produce these things at home. There is a second very good side effect of making all these things at home with your children. One vital important thing we're going to see later is math skills. If we cook with our children, they are weighing, they are measuring, they are doubling portions, they are learning vital math skills that we're going to be using later on. So please get in the kitchen with your kids, get them interested in cooking, cook with them. It's been shown many times, children that get in on the action, cooking their own food, helping chop the vegetables, helping prepare the meat, putting things in the oven under supervision, they are far more likely to eat the food they're given. When we control our children's nutrition using the paleo or keto healthy eating methods, it's going to greatly increase the chance of increased concentration and decreased stress levels. If in doubt, please consult a nutritionist or a doctor for these specific methods of eating. There's one thing I forgot to mention, that's allergies. Obviously, I cannot control all the allergies of all the children and develop systems or systems of nutrition for each child. Obviously, if your child is allergic to something, they're allergic to something. Use common sense. Now, this brings me on to sleep. Sleep, as we know, is very, very important. Generally, hunters need more sleep than farmers. This is not always the case though. I have found some hunters that get by very well on about six hours sleep. However, normally, most hunters require more sleep than the general. Children also require more sleep than adults. So please assure your children are getting at least nine or 10 hours of sleep a night. This has to be uninterrupted. Now I know there's, but my children wake up in the night, or they wake up very early, or they can't fall asleep at night. Children that can't fall asleep at night, as well as adults, tends to come from unreleased stress that they've accumulated during the day. Frustration, not enough exercise, too much sugar, so changing the diet and following the whole process. This is why I said this ecosystem must be controlled in all aspects for this to work. If we're off by one, it's not going to have the success that we need.
This brings me to the next topic. Exercise. Hunters need a lot of exercise. If we're talking about an ADD, -er, they will need more, possibly, than perhaps a dyslexic child. I've heard parents say, yes, but my child does football every day and then he goes to the park and then, and it doesn't work. Okay. For hunters, not all exercise is equal. Football training, soccer training, rugby training, martial arts, boxing, all these sports have different levels of activity. What a hunter must produce when they are exercising is high levels of endorphins. Why do we need to produce these high levels of endorphins? Because our brains work differently from farmers. To produce these endorphins, we need intense exercise. So a quick relaxed game of tennis is not going to do it. Soccer practice isn't going to do it. So what am I recommending? By now, most people have heard of CrossFit. CrossFit Kids is one of the best types of exercise that hunter children can do. Now I know we don't all have CrossFit centers close to us. What other alternatives are there? For slightly older children, I recommend Olympic weightlifting. I recommend powerlifting. I recommend boxing. I recommend martial arts. If they are martial arts and not the sport of martial arts, there's a big difference. What do I mean by this? A martial art teaches, among other things, discipline. The sport is doing a couple of exercises, sitting down, not very controlled. The discipline of a true martial art can also help greatly. The king of sports for hunters is CrossFit or CrossFit style workouts. For younger children, because many people misinterpret what Olympic weightlifting, CrossFit, powerlifting is when we relate it to children. So other things we can do, gymnastics, calisthenics. These are great ways to exercise intensely when every time we train, it changes. This is what makes CrossFit so great. Every time you go, you do a different workout. If we go out and run every day, and we run five kilometers every day, then we're not going to get what we need because our body gets used to doing that exercise and it stops producing the endorphins. So when we're talking about exercise, we're not only talking about burning calories, we're talking about producing endorphins. This is so important to de-stress and to be able to relax. 20 minutes or even 10 minutes of high intensity exercise, HIIT, H-I-I-T, high intensity interval training. 10 minutes of this will produce far more endorphins than playing an hour of football or soccer or rugby. Training in American football, training for rugby is very intense. This can work very well as well. As long as where they train, they are training at a very intense level. Relaxed training sessions do not work for us. So after exercise, there's something else I have found very, very beneficial for hunters. Now I know so many people put their hands up and say, my ADHD kid is never going to do yoga. There are many, many, many different types of yoga and different people will be suited to different types of yoga. Now, when I say talking about yoga, I'm not talking about for our children going for an hour, three times a week to a yoga center to do yoga. I'm talking about 10, perhaps 15, 
possibly even 20 minutes of yoga every single day. So yoga and exercise doesn't need to take up necessarily more than 20 minutes combined a day. Can we find 20 minutes a day to help our children produce the endorphins they need? Yoga, when we follow a different pattern every day, then this will help our body release the stress built up within our body and our minds. When hunters do yoga, it has to be slightly different from farmer yoga. There are four main categories of yoga. There are many fashionable names of different types of yoga out there. Kundalini yoga, Ashtanga yoga, is a type of Hatha yoga. And it is a very, very intense type of Hatha yoga. However, for me, out of the old four categories, the most important one is actually Raja yoga. Why is this the best type of yoga for hunters? Because not only are we training the body, it concentrates on the mind. There is one type of Raja yoga that we can start to do, which is growing in popularity right now. And this is yin yoga. It's a very slow type of yoga. But when we're in these postures, we concentrate on the mind, relaxing the mind. Now we can find Hatha yoga instructors that also do these things. Yoga is a very personal thing. So we cannot find one instructor our kids don't like that instructor. If we're finding an instructor, we can also do it at home. YouTube has many, many good yoga classes. But do not write off yoga just as a martial art because your child did not connect with that one teacher. You may have to try several places. So how do we get our children into doing exercise and yoga? One of the most important points is that our children see us doing it. How did I get my girls involved in yoga? Very simply, every day I started doing yoga in the living room on my mat. My girls saw me doing yoga in the living room every day and their curiosity built. So I let them do it with me. They loved it. They now do it regularly. I did not say to my girls, okay, let's do some yoga. I simply started. It took a couple of weeks and then eventually they came around and their interest was spiked when they saw I was improving. This is the same as with exercise. If you don't exercise yourself, don't expect your children to. If you do have a CrossFit gym near you, go. One of the great things about CrossFit gyms or boxes is they allow you to take children with you. So you can go do your exercise and your children will watch. I'm not saying the first day they're gonna be interested in doing it too. But give it a couple of weeks, and if you don't see your kids going for the rings, going for the pull-up bars, I will be very, very surprised. Another important thing in this ecosystem is breathing. Breathing is one of the most important things we do, and we do it all the time. Every single minute, whether we're awake or asleep, we breathe. There are two types of breathing that children tend to do unconsciously. There is the type A, which girls do, and there is the type B, that boys generally do. This isn't always the case, but it is commonly the case. So what do girls do? They tend to breathe from the chest and they don't breathe with the belly. Chest breathing. Boys tend to do belly breathing. Did you see my thumb moving in and out on that camera? That's belly breathing. My chest wasn't moving. Whereas the girls, the chest moves and the belly doesn't. Both these types of breathing, when done over a long period of time, actually causes our body 
to stress. So we must learn to breathe correctly. So how do we do this? And how do we make it a habit? By practicing every day and by gentle reminders. Again, if we do it ourselves and we have rapport built with our children, they will naturally join our type of breathing. So what is that type of breathing? It's what many call the yogic breath. Yes, yoga is actually very important and has much information to help hunters. So how do we do this yogic breath? What is very important is we use our belly, our ribs, and our chest. Put your hand on your belly. Breathe in. You can just see my thumb appearing and disappearing at the bottom of the screen. That is because my belly is moving in and out. The middle breath, or the ribs. If we put our hands just so, and we breathe in and expand our ribs, our hands separate, and when we exhale, they get closer together. Chest breathing. Again, my hands. The yogic breath is the union of all three. First we breathe in through our tummy, then our ribs, then our chest. And then we gently release all three. And we breathe in, one, two, three, gently release. In yoga, they say we are born with a certain amount of breaths in our lifespan. So the slower we breathe, the longer we live. Now, I'm not going to say whether that's true or not. However, I do know that if we breathe, practicing this constantly and consistently, our breathing over time will naturally be created into a habit of breathing from the yogic breath, the whole breath. This helps our bodies be in a relaxed state. It might take some practice, especially for our children. I found children that have found it extremely difficult to change their style of breathing. One good tool to use with children to get them to learn to breathe more wholly is go for a quick run. They get out of breath and the body will naturally use the other parts that they don't normally use to increase the oxygen flow. So when they're out of breath, make sure they're realizing what they're doing. Then we can practice that in calm states. From breathing, we can go on to breathing techniques or pranayamas. Breathing techniques, there are many. And again, in yoga, this is a whole subject to itself. However, I have found there are two main breathing techniques. Again, when practiced every day, it only takes one or two minutes, can greatly help us. The first is we breathe in, filling all our lungs very quickly, and then we let the air out. We do this 30 times, or between 20 and 30 times. We then expel all the air from our lungs and hold without any air in our lungs for as long as we can without forcing it. And then we fill up our lungs, relaxed, and we hold the air for as long as we can. When the breath is exhaled, a good trick is to bend over slightly and pull our stomachs in as well. We pull it in, flattening our stomach or more, producing our rib cage so we see it clearly. This also helps all the organs 
pump correctly. So, we breathe in 20 or 30 times. We start off by doing this once, and we may feel slightly dizzy as we do it, that's absolutely fine. We may get tingling in our fingers, we may get tingling in our feet, and this is absolutely fine. When we get used to doing this, and after those sensations subside, we can then go and do it. Twice, as soon as we've finished the inhale, we immediately go into the breathing again, another 20 to 30 times. We can build this up, to ideally three to five repetitions. We can do this in the morning when we're cleaning our teeth. We don't have to find a specific extra time of day to do this. Oh, there are many times we can find for doing these things. On the drive to school, practice this every day. And again, it greatly helps us reduce our stress. Now I mentioned there were two techniques. We've seen the first. The second, we place two fingers on our forehead. We then have our little finger and our thumb. We close one nostril, breathe in. Breathe out. Do this five to ten times, then go the other way. When you become well practiced at this technique, you'll find you can actually control, without blocking your nostril, which side of your nose you inhale from and exhale from. This again, done, 20 to 30 times, greatly helps us using the full breath to reduce stress levels. Finally, in the ecosystem, rhythm and routine. Rhythm and routine, I am not talking about at 8 o'clock we do this, at 8.05 we do this, at 8.10 we do this, at 8.15 we do this. Some hunters like that, and that's absolutely fine. Others, myself included, cannot stand regimented time schedules. However, rhythm and routine is very good for helping us reduce our stress levels. Before we go to bed, we get our clothes out for the next day, put them next to the bed. So in the morning, we get out of bed, perhaps we go to the toilet first, we then get our clothes. We do not have to think about what clothes we're going to put on because we already got them out. After doing that, we brush our teeth or we have breakfast or the regular systems we use. Perhaps if we're brushing our teeth in the morning, we practice the breathing technique. If we're lucky enough and we have time to do 10 minutes of yoga in the morning as soon as we get out of bed before we get dressed, we can introduce that too. Perhaps we use the yoga after school, before afternoon activities start. Everything follows the same rhythm, the same routine, every day. Not necessarily at the same times, 
but we know what comes next. As I said, this does not mean that we sit down to dinner at 8.06 every single day. It means after finishing our homework, after doing our exercise, after doing whatever we have in our system, we do the next thing. Now we talked about the ecosystem. Even when we do everything within that ecosystem, there are times that stress is going to be higher. Maybe they had a bad day at school, maybe something happened at home, maybe we as parents lost our temper, that is affecting the children. Maybe we have come home from work and we're highly stressed, or we've just had a bad day at home, we're highly stressed, and obviously our stress gets reflected on to our children. So how can we combat these things in the short term? We have the breathing exercises that are a great technique that we can use. We feel ourselves stressed, we can stop, we can do them and we will feel better. There are other techniques that we can use with our children that can also help greatly. These techniques are to be used punctually when we see high stress. We can do them throughout the homework. We can do them in the car. We can do them when we get home from school. What are these exercises? Number one, lazy eights. We draw eights lying down, hence the lazy, with our left hand and notice we're not going down in the middle, we're going up in the middle. With our right hand. With both hands. Some children find this very easy. Some children find this very difficult. How can we help them? We can get mummy's lipstick. We can paint it on the mirror of the bathroom a giant eight to help them follow it. We can draw it on a piece of paper. We can stand in front of them and do it with them. Not holding their hand literally, but guiding them so they can follow our hand. Another exercise we can do is called cross crawls. Cross crawls. We start with our hands, we bring our knees up, Um, right hand to left knee, left hand to right knee. When we've mastered this well, we can then go, instead of our hand, our elbow. And when we've mastered this, we can go one step further, place our hand on our chin. We can do this walking forwards. We can do this walking backwards. This is the cross crawl. And it's a great way to change what we're doing. For example, if we are sitting down, doing homework, and we see our child needs a change, right, get up, let's do some lazy eights, let's do some cross crawls. Great. Sometimes when we're stressed, all we need is a change of scene. Get outside, get some fresh air. Hunters do really, really well in nature. The more time we can spend outside, I don't care whether it's raining, snowing, get outside, have fun, play outside, fresh air. If you have dogs, great. Go for a walk with the children in the country, in the park, be outside. The other short-term thing we can do is something called the learning state. This we should be doing every time we're doing homework, especially when revising for a test. If your children learn to do this by themselves and they do this in every single class, they will learn to absorb more information from the teacher more easily. So this, again, in itself is very powerful. Some children take it on board and they do it and they have excellent results. Other children forget about doing it when they're in class and it will take them a lot longer to do it. So what is this learning state? Normally, people are taught 
to focus when they look at one point. We look at one point the majority of the time, and everything around us becomes unimportant, and we don't see it. However, if we change simply the way we look at things, this produces a different mental state, and this we will see in the brain waves. So how do we do this? Well, instead of looking directly at one point, we have to learn to become aware of what's at our sides. Make sure you, or the person you're doing it with, is looking ahead with their eyes. Bring some fingers up and ask them how many fingers you're holding. Go everywhere. Go as wide as you can. When they can clearly see that and they can tell you what they can see, whether they're in the room, outside, it doesn't matter, but what they can see whilst keeping their vision fixed on a point and they practice seeing everything around them, we can stay in this state for longer. By doing this with our eyes, we get into a state that we call a learning state. This is an optimal brain wave we produce by doing this to be able to absorb more information. So please teach your children to do this. When you start to see them getting stressed, those triggers we talked about before, stop them, get them to refocus and continue. Now, another thing I'm going to include here, to learn to do things with both hands. What do I mean everything? I mean everything. I mean writing. I mean playing tennis. I mean throwing a ball. When it comes to kicking a ball, we need to learn to kick it with both feet. If we're skateboarding, learn to skateboard both ways. Snowboarding, same thing. Learn to do writing and drawing with both hands. And this is why it can also be an intermediate technique or a short-term technique. If we're doing homework, a lot of time we need to be writing. When we see a little bit of frustration getting in, let's play a fun game. Let's try and write with our other hands. When we try and write with our other hands, again, we're changing the way we're thinking. It's a great fun activity. This is enough to help us break that cycle, getting into frustration and stress. And so I include it as a short-term technique. The other short-term technique we can use using both hands, because we have to be able to do this equally with both hands, is juggling. If we learn to juggle with three balls, not going over, but going through the middle, when we can do this in the learning state, whilst we're not looking at the balls, this is another great de-stressing technique. And a little tip for you parents, for you to do as well. If you learn to juggle and you're in your car and you're driving and you start to feel some road rage, imagine yourself juggling. You will soon find yourself calming down in the car. If you practice this technique and find it beneficial, obviously you know it's going to be beneficial for your children too. So how to start to learn to juggle with children? Well, first of all, we have to learn to throw and catch a ball in one hand and both hands, or the other hand. Throw in one hand, catch in the other. Throw in the other hand, catch in the first. Once we can do this, we can then start to practice with two balls, and then we go to three balls. Again, there are many places online that will show us learning how to juggle. So short-term exercises, lazy eights, cross crawls, the breathing techniques, the learning state, learning to do things, or doing an exercise, with both hands, juggling, and of course, making sure we're following the rhythm and routine of what we do. All of these things are quick changes to reduce those stress levels. As I said, the other thing, getting outside for a couple of minutes, getting outside, going for a run, burning off a little bit of energy, getting our breathing going. Short-term solutions, immediate changes in stress and frustration situations. Media. What do I mean by media? Television. 
tablets, telephones, radio, music, game consoles, media. How much should our hunter children be using media? Very simply, as little as possible. If we're using media for educational purposes, that's fine. Otherwise, restrict to the absolute maximum media. That means ideally zero, especially during the week. However, each child is different. As parents, what we need to do is test for each type of media how long it takes our children to have reactions to that media. I'll give you an example. One of my daughters, she can watch 45 minutes of television and there is no change in emotion, there is no change in stress levels after 45 minutes of television. It can serve to sit down for a little while. If she goes over 45 minutes, we start to get stress and stroppiness and frustration and emotion level changes. Therefore, she is restricted to a maximum during the week and at the weekend, it does not matter, 45 minutes. Perhaps we make an exception every now and then, that at the weekend, if it's raining, we watch a movie. But other than that, it's 45 minutes. Each child is different, and some can have more, and some can have less. The general rule is, the less the better. Those 45 minutes for my daughter doesn't mean to say my daughter gets to watch 45 minutes of television every day. It means the days she gets to watch television, she can watch it for 45 minutes maximum. Playing video games tends to be far shorter. Using other media outlets, using online video streaming, watching lots of channels, YouTube channels, again, this time tends to be less. So why do we have to restrict media? And why is media actually stressful? Because we all sit down and watch TV and relax. No. The next time you watch television, sit and count every time there is a frame change. So when I'm talking about, we go from here to here to here. Again, we go from here to here to here. How often does it happen? Count it. You'll find it's somewhere between three and seven seconds between every single change. And when we actually start to count it and become consciously aware of it, it's actually quite a stressful thing. We do not consciously process this normally, but our subconscious does. And this constant change and high action creates stress in our brains. Playing video games is even worse because there's more excitement, there's more adrenaline being created playing the games. Now I'm not saying video games are all bad. There are some very positive sides, hand-eye coordination, among other things, that are good from video games. For ADHDers, or many ADHDers, it's proof that they can actually concentrate for long periods of time. For this ecosystem of the hunter to work, we need to have the right diet, the right sleep, the right rest and relaxation using breathing techniques, using yoga, using exercise. That is endorphin producing for our systems to work at optimal levels. Meditation for hunters is a very, very productive tool. I'm hearing in my ears, parents screaming at me, saying, 
There's no way my ADHD child is going to sit down and meditate. Practice the things we have already talked about for a few weeks or a few months. Notice the differences. As the levels of stress decrease, we can start to introduce more topics. Although it is included in the ecosystem, I'm going to talk about it in a different video because meditation is a huge topic and it is a very important topic for hunters. And there are ways and technologies we can use to help us. But before we look at meditation, we have to look at brain waves and what we are actually doing when we are meditating. So, as I said, we will leave this for another video. So please, pay attention to the ecosystem. When one of these things is off, you cannot expect a hunter to work at optimal, prime, good, healthy levels. If a hunter has missed sleep, they're not gonna work right. This is going to happen occasionally, and that's fine. Just if a hunter lacks two hours of sleep, don't expect homework to be done. Don't expect low levels of stress, high levels of karmity, because it's not going to happen. We are going to be higher stressed. If our diet is off, it's going to increase our stress. If we're eating sugar, it's going to increase our stress. If we don't do the right exercise, or we skip a couple of days, don't expect the hunter to work properly. Now there are times, as I've said, we miss sleep for certain reasons, we might miss meals for certain reasons, we might miss exercise because we have an injury. That happens when we exercise, that's fine. And also think, exercise, I mentioned an injury, let's say, we have a broken wrist, so we can't exercise. We can. We can exercise without using this wrist, or possibly without using the hands at all. We can do other things. We can go for a run, but not a gentle run. We can do sprint training. Sprint training, when done differently every day, is another way to get that exercise. So just bear in mind, this ecosystem must be nurtured to the best of our abilities every single day. And when it isn't, step back, understand why your children are going to be more stressed, more reactive, their emotions are going to be off, and don't expect the same from them. One of the children I had in the past did dyspraxia, dyscalculia, and was dyslexic. He was also deaf in one ear. Now this child was an amazing child. He managed to write scripts, to make videos for YouTube, and to produce theatrical productions. He managed to get staff and children at the school to flock around him and produce these amazing videos. However, in the classroom, as one would expect, he had great problems. One of the things that I always recommend to my students is to make sure they're in the first two rows of the classroom or as close as they can get to the teacher. Now this child, I asked his mother to ask the teacher to move him and the teacher quite happily accepted. Most teachers do. They put him in the front row on the right hand side. So his left ear, was towards the teacher. Now what the teacher didn't consider was this was his deaf ear. So we can imagine what happened. His grades went down and he had a much harder time in class. Eventually I realized this, got his mother to ask the teacher again to kindly put him on the other side of the classroom where his dominant ear was facing the teacher. When dealing with the schools, this is very helpful for hunters. If we can put them in the front row 
or the second row, and perhaps maybe even the third row. There are a lot of children that don't like sitting in the front row. Therefore, the second and possibly the third are okay too. Now, we also want the dominant ear towards the teacher. How do we test for a dominant ear? If we get the child to stand without moving their feet, you stand behind them and call them and see which way they turn without moving their feet. They will turn in the direction of their dominant ear. So make note of this and then when asking the teacher to move the child, make sure they're placed accordingly. Reading and lighting. Not reading and writing, reading and lighting. This video is mainly for dyslexic children, but it can be a symptom of other hunters. We are talking about when we're reading what light we use. Many children with dyslexia have this phenomenon occur where the words vibrate or move on the page. If this is the case, there are things we need to look at to help stopping this happen. When I was a child, I had this happen to me. When I was doing my homework in the library at school, I could never do my homework apart from maths. I never knew why this happened, but I discovered later on in life that it was because the library was lit with fluorescent bulbs. My textbooks were all glossy and white, and this vibration and this movement of the words that I was not conscious of at the time until asked made it impossible for me to do my homework in the library. My maths book, on the other hand, had paper that was matte and yellowish, very much like the novels that we read. Therefore, I was able to use the fluorescent light with this type of paper. With the glossy photo finish, I couldn't. Fluorescent bulbs for me were my worst enemy. In classrooms, they have fluorescent bulbs, or they used to. They're now changing over to LEDs. The way I got around this was I would sit next to the window. Now I know I previously said the best place for hunter children to sit is at the front, depending on their dominant ear. However, in my case, it was more important to get that natural light than have my dominant ear facing the teacher. So we do have to be slightly flexible with things. When our children have this specific problem, then perhaps we need to study moving them next to the window and take that taking preference over the dominant ear. So what do we need to test? We need to test lights, light bulbs, fluorescent light bulbs, LED light bulbs, all the types of light bulbs there are. We also need to test light bulbs, the different lumens, the amount of light they give off, and the Kelvin, the amount of warmth they give off, or the color. Daylight bulbs are around 5,000 Kelvin. So start here. The lumens, I would say, start the intensity of the light at around 800 lumens. Some children will prefer warmer light. Some people will prefer cooler light. Some people will prefer a more amount of light. Some people will prefer dimmer light. So you're going to have to test different bulbs using different Kelvin, different lumens. We can go to the shop and we can buy them all and we can go home and test them. Or we could go to a shop and ask them very nicely if we can test their different bulbs to see what works. Explain the problem and a lot of shops will be very helpful because then they know you're gonna go back to them and buy the bulbs. The nice thing with LEDs these days, a 5,000 Kelvin, 800 lumen bulb does not have to be expensive. In the past, a daylight bulb would cost a fortune and the amount of electricity it used would also cost a fortune. These days, it doesn't have to be the case. The other thing we can do, if it's also the paper, like it was in my case, with the photo glossy paper, the brilliant white stuff that most textbooks are made of. We can buy colored gels like they use in the film industry on the lights. There is a syndrome called Arlene syndrome. And if you suspect this is going on with your child or you can have it confirmed by your child, you might want to go and get tested for Arlene syndrome. However, you can also buy these gels. We can buy them. Shiny, we can buy them matte, and we can buy a spectrum of colors. Then we simply put the gels over what we're reading, make sure it's the right size to cover the whole page, and test the colors, and test the matte and the shiny. Don't worry if you buy lots of colors and they only pick one, because I've found children that over time, they change from matte 
to glossy and back again, and they change colors over time. And different books, they will prefer different colors. So always have them at hand. And the other colors might be useful in the future. So never think, I bought 200 colors, although 200 might be excessive, get a good spectrum of the rainbow of colors and keep them. And every now and then test to see if your children prefer the other colors or they prefer the matte over the shiny under different light conditions. These days, many children study and read from screens, from media devices. Here, we can change the contrast, the brightness. We can change the font. There are many dyslexic fonts available. We can change the colors. Many people find it easier to read with a black screen and white font. So play around with these things if we're talking about children that have this vibration or movement of words. One of my personal favorites is the original Kindle. I find this much, much, much easier to read from than any book. So if you have one or you can get hold of one, have a look at these as well. Procrastination. Hunters are experts in procrastination. So how do we work against procrastination? Well, first of all, we're not going to try and work against it. That's just not going to work. So what do we have to do to avoid procrastination, to stop it from occurring in the first place? Discipline is the most important thing when it comes to procrastination, right? If we start procrastinating, the more we put something off, the harder it becomes to begin, right? The more we feel we do not control, master, or understand the topic, the more we procrastinate, right? The bigger a task is, the more we procrastinate, right? When we have to do something through obligation rather than choice, the more we procrastinate, right? By asking these questions, Am I not in fact myself procrastinating and not answering the questions? So procrastination is clearly one of our worst enemies, right? Okay, so here are the answers. Wrong, right, 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 wrong, can be. Discipline isn't the most important thing. The longer we take, the harder it becomes, correct. The less we control a subject, the more we procrastinate, correct. The bigger a task is, the more we procrastinate, right. Obligation leads to procrastination. Right. By asking these questions, I'm procrastinating. Wrong. I'm making a point. Procrastination is our worst enemy. It can be. But the real thing we have to look at here to answer the first question of discipline. Why is that wrong? The most important thing is motivation. The longer we wait, the harder it becomes due to lack of motivation. The less we control something is lack of motivation. Doing something through what we perceive as obligation is lack of motivation. Get the picture? So is procrastination our worst enemy? Or is it in fact a lack of motivation? Is that the same thing? We're talking about semantics here. For me, they are slightly different. So instead of trying to stop procrastination, which just isn't going to happen, let's look at how we can increase the motivation of our children, and in fact ourselves. When starting the homework, or when covering a topic, or when doing something new or something we know that our children don't particularly like, we must be motivated. We must give off that motivation, the interest, the enjoyment of the subject. We must give off motivation even if it's a subject we hated at school, it doesn't matter. We have to convince ourselves that we love this subject now and we want our children to love it too. Therefore, that is motivation enough to give off interest and excitement about the topic at hand to increase their level of interest and motivation. So how do we do this? Well, if we lie to ourselves, not to our children, if we lie to ourselves, for long enough and we pretend to ourselves that we like something, even if we think we don't, if we do it for long enough and often enough, our 
reactions will start to change and we might actually become interested in the subject. How many people do you know, adults, that when they're at school, they hated a subject? And then they had this amazing tutor come along who explained everything in such a way that they just understood everything and your whole attitude suddenly changed towards that subject. This is the person you need to become for your child on every single thing. Now I did say this was a course for parents who really wanted to help their children, didn't I? This is going to take a lot of effort on your part to do, but we can do it, it is possible, and if you really want to help your children and help their concentration and stop their procrastination, you will do this. Find the way, find the interest. Now I'm not saying we're gonna be perfect right off the bat. We're gonna make mistakes, that's absolutely fine. Take your time, make your mistakes, learn. It will be interesting for your children to see you make those mistakes. Mistakes is something we're going to talk about in depth later on. Now there are certain times doing this isn't gonna work. Those times are when the ecosystem is off. At these times, if we need to get some work done, although this is dangerous because we're anchoring negative thoughts and negative emotions to a piece of work, very sporadically, we can offer prizes for goals. This is something I said needs to be done very rarely because we are, as I said, anchoring negative feelings towards the subject just to get a prize. Isn't this what everybody feels who doesn't like their job? If we do use prizes, then we have to take something into consideration. Now, an adult in a job after a certain amount of time to keep them interested in that job, they expect to get a pay rise. If a child is doing some work, they're going to expect the same thing. Something very important to take into consideration when talking about prizes or rewards. To a 30 year old adult, two years tends to be the amount of time it takes for them to say, I want to raise. To a six year old, two years is the equivalent to six years of that 30 year old. And so for a 12 year old, those same two years feel like five years. Why does this happen? Because time to a human is not linear. The older we get, the faster time passes. When you're three, a year, Christmas to Christmas, birthday to birthday, is a very, very long time. Yet to an adult, it isn't that much time. Because relatively, the year in your lifespan, in your memory, is a far smaller fraction of your life, and therefore time appears to speed up. So why are we talking about this? Well, when it comes to rewards, if two years seems like 10 years, then we must increase those rewards far more frequently. And if you do the math, it'll actually work out to every couple of weeks or months that those rewards need to start to be increased. How far do we go with increasing rewards? And this is part of the problem with this topic. So the key to curing procrastination is to stop thinking about procrastination and start thinking about motivation. It's actually the only thing that really matters. If we can motivate ourselves and our children, then it's going to be far easier to do the work. Unfortunately here, I can't give you the specific answers of how to motivate yourself. Because unfortunately, I don't know you personally. You do know yourself. So understand how motivation works for you and motivate yourself to make all the topics when dealing with your children interesting and exciting. It may mean you have to go and learn the subject previously in such a way so you can then feed them the information. Concentration. When it comes to doing homework, this is one of the biggest challenges many parents feel they have. The lack of concentration of their child. This can be with homework, 
and this can be with many other activities as well. So how do we improve concentration, working specifically and directly on concentration? All the other previous requirements we have been talking about, the ecosystem, make sure they're in their parasympathetic rather than their sympathetic nervous system. This is the first key we must get. Using rapport, make sure they're in a calm, relaxed state. If they're not in a calm, relaxed state, perhaps we need to go and do some exercise, perhaps we need to eat some food. There are many things we can do previously to the time we need to concentrate. We've spoken about media before and how is not necessarily a good thing. However, sometimes when we're using it for specific reasons, it can be very beneficial, specifically music. Now we've all heard that classical music can make children more intelligent, it can help us study. Well, it's partially true and partially not. It's not really the classical music. What is important when we are studying, when we are learning, is to have music that is specifically at 60 beats per minute. Why is this? Because when we go to a discotheque, we know that our heart rates increase with an increased rate of beats per minute of the music. We can get excited, we can get happy, we can get depressed, we can get calm with music. Now, as the human rest state for the heart is 60 beats a minute, if we put on, in the background, 60 beat a minute music, it will help our heart rate slow down to 60 beats a minute. So when learning, put 60 beat a minute music on in the background. It doesn't have to be classical music, yet, if it can be classical music of CD quality, then all the better. Why CD quality? Because other qualities lose the benefits of those instruments of classical music. So therefore, if we're playing at a lower quality, we can have electronic music, we can have classical music, we can have any music that is 60 beats a minute. Whilst talking about music, we can also talk about sleep. If we want to put some relaxing music for sleep, then we want to put it even lower than 60 beats a minute, perhaps 30 or 40 beats a minute. Again, this will help the heart slow down and help the body relax. But back to concentration. Concentration, the length, although we can average it for ages and types of people, is very individual. So what we must do is time exactly to the second how long our child or children can concentrate. The way we do this is we get an activity that they enjoy doing, but not too stimulating. And we time exactly how long to the second they concentrate on doing this task. Now it could be playing a game, it could be drawing if they enjoy drawing, it could be playing an instrument if they enjoy playing an instrument. It can be anything, as I said, as long as it's not too stimulating. Now we take these times over several different days to find their average concentration level. We are then going to work with three quarters of this time. If we think three quarters of this time is a push, then we can go to half. But my child only concentrates for 12 seconds. Okay, so we start with six to nine seconds. We can ask them about one question before we have to change topics for a little while before we can ask another question. This might seem a little counterproductive, yet doing it this way, we will be able to increase their concentration quickly and smoothly. So we take three quarters of the time, and that is how long we apply to the work or the task we want to do with them. Now, one little thing that I'm going to add in here is when we are wanting our children to concentrate with us, it can be homework. It can be asking them to take out the trash. It can be anything. There is a rule of thumb that we must pay attention to. One foot, or about 30 centimeters, per year of age of the child. And of course, we must always be looking at the child with eye contact when doing the task at hand. Whilst 
giving commands, asking questions, giving information, we want to be using visual language. So instead of, do you understand? It's, do you see this? Instead of, have you heard me? Can you imagine what I just told you? Explain to me this. Tell me what you see. Adding this in will greatly increase concentration and response. So we take this three quarter concentration level. This is our starting point. Whatever we're doing, we use that amount of time we have, be it nine seconds or two minutes, it doesn't matter, that's what we use. And we do the task that we need to do, even if it's homework, and we do it within that time before changing subject, doing something else, a little game, and then coming back and continuing. Now, if we get it wrong, because we are going to very definite times, let's say their concentration is 15 seconds and we push it to 20 seconds. This can easily happen. So if we get it wrong, it doesn't matter. We step back, we play a game and we go back again. So what is the reason for doing this? We do this to enable their peak interest points. If their concentration is for example, one minute, their peak interest in something will be about three quarters of the way through their total concentration period. When we hit peak interest, this is really what we're looking for. That is when we stop doing a task. Why do we do it this way? Because if a child is actually interested in something and we stop them right at the point of maximum interest, this is the easiest way for them to turn around and want more, and we don't give it to them. In that point, we wait a little while, maybe we play a game, we go back, maybe we wait till the next day. Because we spiked their peak interest and left them hanging, they're going to want more. This is the way television series work. They always give us a cliffhanger, so we want more. This is the point of what we're trying to get. So we work with concentration on about three quarters of the time, looking for peak interest. Now, if they don't have any interest in the subject, we're not teaching it right. We don't have enough interest. We're not giving them enough motivation. So remember those cues. Now, when they're at peak interest, there's a technique we can use called anchoring. When we see they're at their peak interest, maximum point of enjoyment, interest, concentration, we want to anchor this point. What is an anchor? It can be as simple as pulling your ear, touching your shoulder, smiling, using a certain catchphrase you might use. And we use this repeatedly over and over and over, every time they're at peak interest. Then we can use this anchor to help us increase or promote interest in another subject. This must be used lightly. Because if we anchor successfully by repeatedly, every time they reach peak interest, we just touch our shoulder. It might feel a bit weird at first, that's fine. But then if we constantly use this anchor every day to spark interest, we're going to be anchoring whatever comes before their peak interest or whatever state they're in to this point. So it's a tool, it's a very powerful tool, but it can only be used in specific situations that day that their ecosystem hasn't been maintained, that rare occasion, they're tired, then we can possibly just give us a little push, use the anchor, it'll bring emotions up in them slightly. It's not a miracle thing, but it is a little trick to help us. As we do these things, we will notice that the concentration time and the peak interest time start to increase. As they start to increase, obviously, we are going to increase the times we work. By how much do we increase the times? Well, if we work on a general rule of thumb of five to 10%, that'll be fine. But what we're looking for is that peak interest. If we hit it, we stop. Now remember, some days peak interest could be shorter than their average concentration time. So we've got to be looking for it and we stop there. Always stop at peak interest. So another thing we obviously have to talk about when talking about concentration 
is distractions. What are distractions? Is mess a topic we'll talk about later a distraction? It could be, it might not be. If we are studying on the bed, having all the books out, is that a distraction? This can actually be a very good thing. If we have all the books out that we are studying at school relative to the different subjects and the different topics at hand, we have all the pages out, just like if we put posters on the wall of the information we're studying, another very useful technique, the subconscious mind, when losing concentration on what we're doing, will be glancing at the other things. And our subconscious mind can help to process this information without even thinking about it. There have been studies on ADHDers, and this is a highly, highly effective tool for them to study with. Put fun, enjoyable posters, pictures, information on the walls, on the desks of the topics we're studying currently, the topics we've studied in the past, and the topics we're going to study next. We're going to see something called the 111 rule in a later video. Now, this is about once we've learned something, how to keep remembering it. If we put, for example, some big pin boards on the wall of their bedroom, and we put one for the hour, one for the day, one for the week, and one for the month. This is the stuff we've already studied, and we're going to have to review later. We'll talk about this a little bit more later on. So having everything out on the bed, on the floor, on the desk, on the sofa, wherever we're studying, does not necessarily have to be a distraction. So what is a distraction? Well, one of the biggest distractions is actually nothing to do with the child. It's to do with you, the parent. And that's your mobile phone. Make sure it's turned off and in the other room. If a lot of people call you at home on the landline, make sure it's turned off when we want our children to concentrate. The television, if it's not being used for the study session we're doing, make sure it's turned off. Make sure all iPads are out of the way. If there's the PlayStation or whatever console you have, maybe it's not turned on, but if it's sitting there, it can be a distraction. So make sure all those things are put away when possible. So I just mentioned this thing about posters for ADHDers. Does it work for ADDers? Well, I'm not ADHD myself, I am ADD. I still remember the posters from my geography classroom at school. I still remember how a power station works. I still remember what nuclear fusion and nuclear fission is from the posters my geography teacher had on his wall in the classroom in primary school. Yes, nuclear fusion and nuclear fission in primary school. I remember it. We didn't really cover it as a big topic, but I still remember it from those posters. This is very powerful stuff when we use it because these posters were bright, fun. So every time I got distracted in geography class, which happened quite a lot, I was looking at these posters. We can do this as well with the atlas or the map of the world on the ceiling of the bedroom, on the walls if we have enough space, so the children are constantly glancing at the map of the world and they will be processing countries, continents, unconsciously, over time, and they'll have a good idea of this subject if we simply put a map of the world on the ceiling. But for now, concentration, remember, we take three quarters of the average time they can concentrate looking for that peak interest. We work to that. We change the subject, we come back again. If it's nine seconds, it's nine seconds. This may seem a ludicrously short amount of time, but yet for an adhd -er, it's amazing the amount of information they can actually absorb in nine seconds. And nine seconds will very quickly increase to 10, 11, 12, 13, 30, 45, 60, 120, and it will keep going up. So work from the level of your child at the beginning and increase as they increase. Remember, we want to be working, especially when we're pushing the concentration, I say pushing lightly, everything 90% easy, 10% push. Possibly 80% easy, 
20% push. When we are pushing only 10% or 20% of the information that could be challenging to them whilst the rest remains easy, it's very easy for concentration to increase very rapidly. Now, unfortunately, in most schools, children learn that mistakes are bad. We as parents unwittingly also teach our children that mistakes are bad. However, mistakes are vitally important to learning. If we don't make mistakes, we can't learn. A baby learns to walk by falling over many times. A child learns to ride a bike by constantly falling off. Mistakes are good. Mistakes are great. Mistakes should be celebrated because the more mistakes we make, the faster we can learn. It is said that Thomas Edison took 4,000 attempts to create the light bulb. And after he had created the light bulb, he was asked by a reporter how he felt to fail to create a light bulb. 3,999 times. Edison's answer reportedly was he didn't ever fail to create a light bulb. He purely learned 3,999 ways how not to make a light bulb. If we have negative feelings rooted to making a mistake, everything is going to become very difficult. So we must make sure when our children make mistakes or attempt to do something and hold back because of it, we must change the attitude. Now, unfortunately, many of you will already have children in this point. They already hate making mistakes. So how can we go about changing this? Well, one of the best ways to go about starting to change this is take up a new activity. Take it up together. If you've never done, for example, archery, Find a place you can go and do archery. Go with your child. Every time you make a mistake, laugh about it, enjoy it, make a clown of yourself. Get the point across that making mistakes can be fun and it can be enjoyable. If we do this with several new activities, we can start reasoning with our children and showing them and applying what they've already seen from us and when they've had a good time making mistakes, we can then apply it to the everyday things that they don't like making mistakes on. So if you have children that are already at the point that they don't like making mistakes, go and do this. See how long it takes. Set yourself a challenge and see how long it takes you to change their minds about making mistakes. The one who takes the less time wins. Meditation. This is actually one of my favorite topics to talk about. So, as I mentioned in previous videos, I'm not expecting an ADHD -er to be able to suddenly sit down for 20 minutes and meditate. And meditation takes a lot of practice. How are we going to go about teaching, especially children, how to meditate, as it is not something we do as a Western civilization normally? Disciplining the mind tends to be forgotten about. So how are we going to do this and speed up the process to be able to do it. Before we look at meditation in itself, we have to understand what we do when we meditate. When we meditate, the objectives for us as hunters is not to get to the stage of a Zen monk. It is to be able to learn to control our brains. But to be able to control our brains, first of all, we have to know what we're trying to control. Let's look at brain waves. We have the delta wave, which goes from 0 0.2 to 
to 3 hertz. We have the theta wave that goes from 4 to 7 hertz. We have the alpha wave that goes from 8 to 16 hertz. We have the beta wave that goes from 16 to 31 hertz. And we have the gamma that goes from 32 to 100 hertz. Now, what does all this mean? Well, each level changes how our brain works. We need to understand which state we're trying to get to when meditating and from where we're starting from. Now, within these waves, there are subgroups that to us really aren't that important. So if you do your research and look online, you might find some other levels within these, especially the gamma, as it's a huge range. However, for what we need, these five basic levels are good enough. So the delta wave refers to the dream or deep meditative state. The theta wave relates to deep relaxation and the state where we fall asleep. The alpha wave relates to a relaxed state. The best information absorption rate happens here. We have the beta wave, which is our general waking state for most people. And then we have our gamma wave. This is our hyper state, our super alert state. As we learn to control all of these states, it is when we are in the gamma state that we can control all the other states. Now you may have noticed the gamma wave is called the hyper state. So can you guess where hyperactivity occurs? In which brain wave level? Which frequency exactly controls each hyperactive state? It's very difficult to answer. Different levels of hyperactivity will of course induce different hertz frequencies. Unfortunately, I cannot give you an exact frequency for each person. Each level also has a relative language or system it uses. Delta waves work, as in the dream state, in symbolic ways, hence dreams. The theta wave, or the deep relaxed state, works on feelings and sensations. The alpha wave works on imagery. It is a highly visual state. So guess where ADD is and dyslexics lie? The better wave, or the general waking state of most people, is the language, the dialect level. And of course the gamma wave controls all of the above. So depending on each hunter and what we do, the brain waves we use are going to lie at different frequencies. What do we have to do with this? Well, ideally for everyone, we need to learn to control all the states. So instead of concentrating on one particular state for one particular hunter, we're going to concentrate on learning all of the states. At the end of the day, this is going to help all of us control all our minds. We need to start in our level and learn what it is. An ADD or a dyslexic who has problems working in the language or dialect state but is comfortable in the imagery state first needs to learn the imagery state. The ADHD -er needs to learn their state, which is the gamma state. Once we can control these, once we have learned exactly what each state is, we can then start to learn all the other states. But again, how are we going to do this? There are sound technologies out there that we can use to help us get into specific brainwave categories or hertz. There are three or four different systems depending on how we look at it. One is called binaural beats, another isochronic tones and monaural beats. And then there are pure wave frequencies. So of these different 
sound systems, which is the best to use? Well, I've found personally binaural beats to be the best because it has some other qualities. Because it works by balancing a wave in the brain with two different tones, this also helps us to increase coordination. However, their isochronic tones and monaural beats work with simple pulses and tones to evoke the states, and so do the pure wave frequencies. So what does this mean? This means binaural beats need headphones. But if we want to use these beats or tones without headphones, we need to use the other types. Isochronic tones and monaural beats need only a speaker. So we can actually put this on with or instead of the 60 beats per minute music whilst studying, inducing the state that is optimal for learning or the alpha state. Binaural beats will need to be used at a separate time. The pure wave frequencies, whilst working similar to the isochronic tones and the monaural beats, also have many different frequencies and you need to understand which each mean to be able to use them. It's far easier to stay within the binaural beats, the isochronic tones and the monaural beats because less knowledge is needed to be able to use them. So where do we find this sound technology? Well, there are two very simple answers to this. One answer is YouTube. If you look up isochronic tones, monaural beats, or binaural beats on YouTube, there are so many to choose from for free. The other thing we can use are mobile telephone apps. There are specific apps for binaural beats, isochronic tones, monaural beats that we can download. Some are free, some you have to pay for. Are the ones that you pay for better than the free ones? Not necessarily. Some of the apps have all these wonderful different states. This we're not bothered with. What we're looking for are the specific states we mentioned previously. The delta, the alpha, the theta, the beta, and the gammas. When we've downloaded the app, or we've looked on YouTube for the particular one we want to use, then it's a question of using the hunter's original state, that level, and listen to it for 10 or 20 minutes a day. This will demonstrate to you and to your child which exact state they're in, and they will consciously be able to process it from the feelings they get inside their brain and their body. Then, once they have understood this consciously, we can then move to the other states. When we move to the other states, they can then consciously understand what the other levels are. So, as we said, most people work on the language level. And this is the level that, at school, is generally required, although it's not the most effective state for learning. When a dyslexic is constantly being pressed into the language state, when we're far more comfortable being in the visual state, if they have learned consciously through use of these sound technologies, they can then consciously produce the other level. If you have a child that suffers from auditory, not visual, epilepsy, something that is very, 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 very rare, you cannot use these systems, unfortunately. Once we've practiced using the binaural beats on each level, then we can start to talk about what I call meditation for hunters. Meditation for hunters is simply using a meditative technique, which we're going to look at now, whilst concentrating on a specific level or frequency, consciously trying to reproduce without the sound technology, just purely creating it by ourselves sitting in a comfortable state. Now, how long should we be sitting in these states meditating? Well, this comes back to how long can our children concentrate for while sitting quietly 
and meditating. If it's a question of 10 or 20 seconds, then it's 10 or 20 seconds as concentration increases with our children. And meditation will help this greatly. Then we can sit for longer. Ideally, we want to be meditating for at least two or three minutes when we have the ability to concentrate for that long and slowly build that up to about 10 or even possibly 20 minutes if they really enjoy doing it. There are many ways to meditate. However, we're going to look at three simple systems of meditation. One is called Zazen. Another is called using totems. And the third is guided meditation. Zazen literally means just sitting. Totems brings into focus your totem. What is a totem? It is something that we like, an image that we can imagine in our heads and focus on that image whilst we're trying to bring these states into consciousness. Guided meditations is a matter of listening to someone or an audio to help you meditate. So which is better and which is worse? Well, they have different levels of experience. Zazen takes quite a lot of practice to master for long periods of time, although it's quite simple to do when doing it for a question of 10 or 20 seconds. Using totems is very similar to Zazen. However, if we have an image, whatever the child wants it to be, it could be a teddy bear, it could be a tree, it could be anything. If they feel their thoughts wandering, all they have to do is bring their attention back to the image of their totem. A guided meditation is probably the easiest to do. However, we need to be in a quiet place where we can listen to the person or the audio guiding us through the meditation. It's very simple because we just have to sit and follow. However, if you wish to use meditation in the car, then Totems or Zazen is going to be far easier to do unless we have a CD of the meditation. If we have the CD of the meditation in the car, this can be very distracting for the driver. However, Zazen and Totems, if the children are doing it quietly in the back of the car, does not cause any problems for the driver. Each system has different benefits and different negative effects. Some are more useful in some places and some are more useful in other places. Zazen. Just sitting, focusing on consciously getting to the level we are aiming at, whether it be gamma, alpha, beta, delta, theta, it doesn't matter. Each practice we want to be practicing a different level. We might perhaps, as we said first of all with the sound frequencies, focus on one specific frequency. We can then use meditation to consciously get that frequency the feeling, the sensation it causes in our brains and our bodies. And we can then move on to the next one and meditate on the next one. You know your children and which way will be better to do, to cover all the frequencies first and then individually meditate on them or learn all the frequencies and in one meditation, go through all the frequencies or learn one frequency and then meditate on that one frequency before we move on to the next one. Zazen, just sitting, totems bringing our attention to an image of something we like, guided meditations, listening to someone or an audio to help you into your meditation. Learning styles. Here we are going to focus on the VACOG or V-A-K-G-O system. Visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. Seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, and tasting. The main two learning styles are auditory and visual. Therefore, we're going to concentrate on these two levels. When it comes to learning at school, these are the main two. 
We do also have the kinesthetic, the manual learning. However, the vast majority of people, when it comes to learning, is auditory and visual. Kinesthetic, we will see more for manipulating maths. However, we've already talked about using cooking to learn maths. That is a kinesthetic type of learning. So, auditory and visual learning. Auditory learners, or what we tend to see in the farmer society and at schools, means it needs the parts to create the whole. Or we get the individual bits, put them together, and we understand what we're talking about. The brain needs features and sequences to create a lineal structure, or it's sequential learning. First we have to do A, then B, then C, then D. Verbal thought or process, or three to four words a second. Because we're sequential and lineal, and this is auditory, we have to literally put our thoughts into words, and this goes at a rate of three or four words per second. Information is stored linearly, and if comprehended as perceived, it works well. However, this means if we learn a song, we know the song, but we have to go all the way through the song to actually find a part we're looking for. We can't just jump to the middle or three quarters of the way through. Auditory learners are analytical. They're responsive. They're self-controlling. And they are better dominant. Visual learners, or 99.9% .9 of hunters, need the whole to create the parts. We can already see the problems forming with the learning process in most schools. Visual learners require patterns to create non-lineal structures, or what we call a world view. We can't go ABC very easily. We prefer F, G, H, get all of them together, and then line them up. We think visually, and we process visually, which means at 32 images per second or more. If an image paints a picture of a thousand words, just think how fast we can actually process information. Real-time processing of information, if it makes sense, can be comprehended immediately. Or we can recall it at a future date when we are organizing our visual memories. We are intuitive, we are reactive, we are impulsive. And, as we've seen previously, we are gamma or alpha dominant. But what is used in the majority of the schooling system is auditory learning. This is where the whole problem of especially dyslexia starts. So why is this so important? We need to remember, whilst we might not be able to do anything at school about this, at home we can. When helping our children at home, we need to remember that our children first need to be given the whole topic we're talking about, whether it's fractions, whether it's our ABCs, it doesn't matter what we're dealing with. We need to look at the whole before the parts. This also means spelling. We need to look at the whole before the parts. We need to see the whole word to be able to break it up. Dyslexics are known to have problems with phonetical relations to letters. However, if we just learn words and words and words visually, our minds subconsciously can actually by themselves, create the parts all by themselves as this by magic. We'll look at spelling in a later video. So, we need patterns to create non lineal structures. In school, we tend to get do number one, do number two, do number three, do number four, do number five, and then we know how to do something. However, because we require patterns over linearly structured sequences, we need to bear this in mind. We use patterns 
to relate in non-lineal forms to be able to work things out. We can process information far faster. Therefore, study times, when done correctly, actually need to be far shorter because we can process the information and our minds can get bored very, very quickly. As I said, this starts at 32 images a second. It starts there. It can go much higher when we're talking about ADHD. So we process information in real time, if we're there, if the pattern and the image that we are learning from and the whole we are learning from is interesting to us, we are able to put this information into our brains and then when we're talking about it later or just simply if we're thinking about it at a later date, we can suddenly seem as though the light bulb reaction, we work it out. As I said, we are intuitive rather than analytical. So we must obviously intuit rather than analyze information. Going through it again, going through it again, analyzing all the points isn't going to help us. It's perhaps seeing more things to do with the whole gives us the possibility using intuition or the subconscious mind to put it all together. We are reactive rather than responsive. If we don't like something, we're going to say it. That's why many hunters are considered stubborn. Again, this stubbornness, it's impulsive rather than self-control. Because we are impulsive, things need to be very relaxed for us not to jump or get bored or change our minds about doing something. And then, obviously, we are gamma or alpha dominant. Therefore, when we are studying, if everything is words, 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 it's not going to be very productive. So how do we go about this? Well, as I said, we can use technology for educational purposes. So perhaps instead of reading words, words, words about a topic, we can watch a video about it. Or we can draw pictures. We can simply create images in our mind about the whole process going on so we can create the parts in our own minds. We will look at more specific examples to do with homework, to do with note taking, to do with reading, to do with writing, more specifically and individually later on. But understand, schools use auditory systems right from the word go. And this is why so many hunters have problems at school. The ones that tend to succeed in their early years most likely had a, a teacher who taught visually or perhaps visual kinesthetically. If they were taught auditorily, then this is where most of the problems come from at school. So how can I tell whether my child is using a visual system, an auditory system, a kinesthetic system, or something we haven't looked at yet, which is auditory digital? Auditory digital is not a tool we can use to learn at school with because it simply means internal dialogue. So how to know which system is right for my child and how to know which system they are using? for each individual task at hand. The eyes are the key to the soul. Well, the eyes do give us the answer to this problem. When we are using our brains, subconsciously, we move our eyes and they move in a regular pattern. When we look up, we are going for visual memories. When we look to the sides, we're going for auditory memories. And when we go down one way, we're looking for kinesthetic or feelings and emotions. And the other way, we're looking for internal dialogue. So how is this useful for us? There is one tip that I'm not going to give you. See if you can work it out. This is a very useful tool to see whether people are lying to you. When we look up and to the left, we're trying to visually construct a new image. When we're looking up and to the right, we are actually recalling an image we have in our brains. When we look to the left, straight to the side, 
we are trying to build a sound in our brains. When we look to the right, we're trying to recall something we have heard. When we look down and to the left, we are trying to recall a feeling or an emotion. And when we look down to the right, we are trying to hear something we already told ourselves. But this can also be reversed. A lot of the time, and this is not always the case, but a lot of the time, left-handers will be the opposite. Right-handers can also be the opposite too. Therefore, before we use this, we must test to see which way our child is orientated. Whether it's visual construct to the left or visual construct to the right, auditory construct to the left, auditory construct to the right, and so on. Once we have identified this, we can see what they are doing to try and recall a memory. If they cannot recall that memory, then we can also see that because they will go to try and construct this memory. Now, there are certain things that you will see people's eyes don't move, and this is because they know the information so well or because they have absolutely no idea about it. So you have to take this into consideration as well. So what would be the guess of if you ask someone the alphabet, where are they going to go? Are they going to go visual or are they going to go to that song or that rhyme that everybody used to learn the alphabet? Most people are going to go to the side. This is a problem for hunters. We need to learn our alphabet visually because we are visual thinkers. So when we see hunters constantly fishing for those auditory memories or trying to construct them auditorily or that looking for that inner voice, that auditory digital to give us the answer, we know when they were trying to learn it, they were being taught with this system and therefore they're trying to find it using the same system. And we know that because the vast majority of hunters are visual, it means we need to go and change the way they are learning that particular task and change it to a visual task. Now I know there are some hunters that are auditory. In all my experience working with hunters, I have never personally come in contact with one though. I have read about people online saying they are hunters and claiming they are auditory. But I have no experience of it and I don't know them personally, so I don't know whether they've misinterpreted the signs or anything. My personal experience is never. I have occasionally met kinesthetic hunters, but they are very few and far between. Let's face it, the whole idea of a hunter, they need to be able to create images and see images and recall images very, very quickly. Okay, when you're hunting, you need to be able to hear. But sight is the number one system that we use as humans when hunting. Therefore, hunters, their dominant system is normally going to be visual. Therefore, we are going to concentrate on visual, although we're also going to see how to test all of them. What was the color of your first car? What is the tune to your favorite song? Everybody is going to go to auditory recall for that. What does the little voice in your head say? Everyone's going to go to auditory digital. How many cats fit in this tree? They're going to construct it visually. What would the alphabet sound like if we skipped every even numbered letter? Auditory construct. How does your tummy feel on a roller coaster? A kinesthetic question. So when we ask, what was the color of your first car? When their eyes go up, this can be a very, very, very quick movement. But when their eyes go up, if they go up to the right or to the left, we make a note that that is where their visual recall is. And the same with all the other questions. If you ask a question and their eyes do not move, or you blink at the wrong time, you might need to ask another question. Some people will be asked what the color of their first car was, and they will be able to recall it because they know so well without moving their eyes. That's fine, just ask them another question. If you go through all of them and note down exactly where each one is, you will notice the visual is up, the auditory is to the sides, and the other two are down. What is most important is whether recalls on the right or on the left. Why is this? Because let's say we have a person whose visual construct is on the left and visual recall is on the right. Their auditory construct is on 
the left and their auditory recall is on the right. If I then go to ask this child, do you know your ABC? And they go, first of all, to auditory, which will be their dominant system they use to learn this. They go to auditory recall, they can't find it. They go to auditory construct, they will, they will probably go to auditory digital as well to see if that little voice in their head can tell them. They'll probably roll around to kinesthetic as well, trying to see whether it feels right or feels wrong. And if all this happens, you know, they were taught the ABC using the auditory system. They don't know it, so they could try to construct it in the system they were taught. And then they go many other patterns trying to look for the information. If this happens, and the child does not know their ABC perfectly, then you know, first of all, the dominant system they're using for this task is incorrect because they don't know it. And second of all, they're in a right mess because they're using the wrong systems for themselves anyway. Therefore, we need to go back and teach them the ABC in a visual way. Now, at the same time, if they go to auditory recall, and they can do the ABC perfectly. Okay, move on. They know their ABC, they learned it auditorily. What works, works. If they look towards where their kinesthetic memories are and they can tell you the ABC, it works. Move on to the next thing. This is for things that don't work. This is how we tell and how to help our children relearn in the right system for them. So please bear this in mind. This is very, very important information so we can understand exactly how the child has learned, whether they've learned, which depends on giving you the right answer or not, and what they're trying to do as a coping mechanism. What we need is for them to use their dominant system. As I said, generally hunters are generally visual. However, some are not. So if every time your child is going to kinesthetic and giving you the right answer, you know that child kinesthetic dominant. Therefore, teach them with the kinesthetic method. Touching things, building things, creating things, cooking things. When they get their answers right, if they go to visual memory to get those things right, then we know they're highly visual. If they go to auditory and they get every single thing right, we know they're auditory. If, when they're going to visual, they're getting things wrong. So ask them a series of questions and test this. At least 90%, in my experience, it's more like 99% of hunters are visual. But test anyway, just for that 1 or 0.01% .01 of hunters that aren't just in case your child isn't. Then how do we use this? When we are learning something new, if they are, for example, visual, as they are learning the information, if they are not looking up all the time, trying to construct the information in visual construct, then ask them to simply look that way as they do it. Then when you're asking them about that information, if they are clearly going to visual recall, or not moving their eyes at all and giving you the right answer immediately, you know it's working. If they can give you partial information and not all of it, it means perhaps that image in their head needs work. If you've been working and working and working on a certain task visually and it just doesn't go in either, you need to change the image you're working on altogether or perhaps add another tool. Maybe we can add some auditory memory to it or some kinesthetic memory. While hunters are visual dominant, it doesn't mean to say we cannot learn a song off by heart. If we can learn to sing a song, then we do have at least a minimum amount of auditory recall. Okay, we might not be able to sing that song without music playing. We need a stimulus to produce the memory, but we still have some ability in that area. It's always a good thing to work on our weaker sides too. So when we are not trying to study for homework or in the school term, we're super tired and just want to get the work done. No, when we're perhaps on holiday and we're relaxed with someone who is highly visual, we can start to introduce some auditory games to practice and stimulate that auditory 
construct and that auditory recall. It's always good to work on our weaknesses. So please bear these eye patterns in mind as they are going to be a really big guide to help you know how your child works memory wise. And as I said, have a think about it and see if you can work out how to know when someone is lying to you by looking at their iPad.